If you don't know Tom, which I can't imagine you don't, he is one of the world's most famous baritones. All I can say is I took a shot and I asked one of my heroes to do an interview with me. Really, I cannot believe it. He said yes. Thomas Hampson is someone I looked up to so much when I was a young singer and now, of course. And as soon as I got the response back that he was happy to and Lucas, he actually knew who I was, I was like, ooh. Having him as an inspiration for both a career path, but also roles that I should sing as I evolve in my career has been such a gift to me. The man has just such a musical knowledge. He's like an Encyclopedia Britannica of opera, musicology, history, style, tradition, all rolled into one incredibly quaffed head. <laughs> this interview was so informative for me, and I hope it is for you too. What are you doing in Paris? Carmen, Carmen, we oui, oh. Yeah. You know, yeah. I I have to tell you, man. I wish to all the all the money and on in China. I I loathe that part. I recorded it. I, it sounds so begrudging, you know. But I was doing a lot of French records with Plasson with EMI back in the day. And here comes Escamillo, and I went, oh please don't make me do that. If it's a baritone, he hasn't got the low. If it's a bass baritone, he hasn't got the high. And just going out there and, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't. And then when I was recording it and realized how actually small the role is, I went, have I been stupid or what? But anyway, I never did it. I never did it on stage ever. And I never sang the aria publicly because all the people that I just thought, you know, I thought Robert Merrill was just kind of the quintessential sound for Escamillo. And yeah. that's not mine. I could just never get out of my mind how I wanted it to sound as it was sounding. <laughs> Tom, that, 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 that was 20 years for me. I sang it first in 2002. I covered it in Central City at Central City Opera and then like I sang it. It, uh, student performance. And I was like, that's the last time I'm ever doing that again. And then as I've gotten a little older, I'm, it's kind of fits a little better. But it's the same as you say, you know, it's it's too high for a bass. It's too low for a baritone and nobody does it. No, and you're never happy with anyone that does it, you know, no, so. No. But then I thought I went one step further. I thought if nobody's going to be happy and when I hear other people sing it, I'm like, well, I could do it at least that well. I might as well get paid <laughs> for it. Well, should we get this started? I mean, it feels like Let's we're do it. already. All right. Well, um, I guess the first thing is that, I, you know, I, because we're, you know, two baritones and I'm not an, a, a, a journalist of any sort, I wanted to ask uh, a not an atypical question that you normally wouldn't get. And it's not about like your big break or your debut or anything, but I want to know what roles that that you've felt were like big moments for you, like like not necessarily, oh, well, my first my debut at the Met, blah, blah, blah. But like, what were the some of the most meaningful moments for you in your operatic career that's an interesting, interesting question uh, but quite frankly they're not they're not that separated from one another i mean yeah. once i got the barber seville in my throat the figaro i i just loved doing the figure i just i just thought figaro was so much fun and i love the caratura and i love the smart ass about it and you know if 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 you get past you can never not be afraid of the aria <laughs> If you are, if you ever go out thinking, "Hey, I got this," you're gonna yeah. die. Yeah. So you know, be very afraid. Yeah. Um, but that sort of hit. I I also for you know very early on, I started with Guglielmo, and I really enjoyed Guglielmo, and I had a, a lot of fun with Guglielmo. I sang the damn thing in three or four different English translations, and from the very beginning, oh, and I. Finally, after about 160 performances in various theaters, I said, I really can't do this anymore. And once I started singing The Count and then Giovanni hit in a big way, it just felt a little incongruous and I wasn't ready to move over to Don Alfonso. So I just, but you know, the, I guess one of the one of the parts that that was a, still in my generation was a, was, an, was a lyric baritone part and considered very often a debut part was Germont and Traviata. So, you know, I sang the aria when I was in school and at the Music Academy of the West, I sang scenes from it. I loved singing Pagliacci, Silvio. And so when I came over to Germany um, in, in the early 80s, just as you were being born um, or something like that, um, 
<laughs> I started a, I started in, in a in a you know major repertoire house. It was Dusseldorf, Duisburg, which was at that time the largest repertoire theater in the world, full season. And you know there were four other lyric baritones. Then came the Cavalier baritones and the dramatic. It was a huge ensemble, and so it took a little while. But the the, take, the first season wasn't so exciting. It was a lot of sort of repertoire work like like Yamadori, even though I'd already sung Sharpless. And uh, uh, and that was that was kind of funny. I went in from my rehearsal thinking, oh, they built me up for Butterfly. They they, yeah. they caught on, right? Yeah. So I go in and the guy just plops down and bangs all over the piano and then goes like this at me. And I went, what? You know? yeah. And he said, that it's your entrance. Haven't you learned the piece? I said, I'm, yeah, sure. If you play my music, I'll sing it. If that is your music, I said, no, it's not my music. Sharpless say, Surai Rampikas will find it. That, that is Sharpless, young man. You don't sing Sharpless. You're singing Yamadori. Ah, anyway, um, so those were those, those were the galley days. But then I moved quickly into the barber and, and Guillermo. Then the count came and I had those. But actually, you know, the count I did, I certainly did the count the first time before before Giovanni but my my but but Giovanni came with Ponel I'd, you would have been too young for Jean-Pierre Ponel but he well, was he, he was, oh my god he was just you know and I did all three da Pontes with him and Hanakua at the same yeah. time Levine and then in the summer with Muti you know <laughs> you know it was it was a pretty heady time so that this the stretchy role that I loved and and I sang early in Europe that was another thing for me is that is that I because the traditions are slightly different in Europe than, than America uh, I maybe started like like Germain and Posa earlier than I probably would have in in the states and Posa was a real dream of mine when I what when I started when I, you first sang Verdi how old were you when you first well, sang well, I was I was in let's see after <laughs> so many decades, um, I would have sung Traviata in the late eighties in Zurich. So I was certainly thirty three, thirty four with that Gemma. was your first, your first foray into Verdi repertoire. Yeah, did it feel but like Posa? Posa came later. Posa came Posa a little came bit after. later. So Traviata was your first one. You know, Matthew's Matthew's rule of thumb, and I wasn't I was so close to Matthew, but I always admired it. We got along. This is Matthew but, Epstein. Matthew Epstein. And and he said, you know, Sam Raimi didn't even buy a Verity score until he was 40 years old. And I, you know, I think that's pretty good advice for, yeah. for a lot of stuff. Of course, Sam and I are not the same. You know, Sam had more, more girth, and but he was also, you know, Sam needed to protect the coloratura. That, you know, that was just such an amazing voice uh and great colleague but um so i didn't push on the i turned down my first macbeth offer um i just didn't feel that i had i, did, I had the chops for that yet and it was also a little bit of a strange production i didn't think that was a good idea so it took a while to get into that but i was certainly in my certainly post 35 certainly late 30s going into my 40s you were talking about the largo and the figaro uh, barbieri you were the first person I saw sing Barbieri live ever in San Francisco no. back in 2000, I think three or so. In that yeah. production where you came in on the Vespa. Do you remember that? <laughs> did you have I to do. learn how to ride the Vespa or did, like, did you already know how to ride a scooter? No, I could ride a scooter. What you had to do was you, you could, on the straightaway, you could go quite fast. Yeah. But to hurt, hit the corners, you had to slow down and then hit the straightaway in the back. So you'd be back in time, you know, la da la 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 Around that house. They built a house in the middle of the, th of the stage and you had to go around yeah. the house. I remember that. And when I was offered the role and I was really pleased to, you know, sort of, I think it was my last production of, of Barber, um, new production. And, uh, and actually it wasn't new, it was a revival. But there was a, there was a whole huli baba about, you know, can he write a Vespa? Will he write a Vespa? Will he, yeah. will he write a Vespa and sing? You know, all sorts of layers of competence and, and ego. <laughs> and then I looked at the production. I said, oh, this looks like a riot. This looks a lot of fun. Um, so this whole career, everybody knows it's about, it's, well, I always say it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's about longevity. And if anybody represents that, it's you. And I hope that I can have 
close to the longevity and consistency that you've had. And um, just I, how, how, how do you do it? What do you have to say about that? How, how, how have you gotten to this point? Um, <clears throat> never give up. <laughs> <laughs> never give up. Never surrender. No, that's right. Uh, you know, take no prisoners. Um, no, look, Lucas, you and I are very much similar. I don't, I don't know you so personally, but I know about you and you have a, you have a, significant and that sounds even patronizing vocal discipline and physical discipline life discipline and i think that's as much the the ground zero of anything about longevity you must have you must know where center is where home is uh you need to you know we're all going to make mistakes we're all going to push a little too far we might even push our voice we're all going to do all that stuff if you know where, where you know, if you're smart enough to know, okay, I've, I've done that, or, I mean, or I'm even going to sing a role that other people may think, which I kind of built my career on, uh, that I shouldn't sing. Um, if you sing it, one, with your voice, and two, if you realize, okay, that is a, that is a mountain over there. I mean, Mandrika never sat easy. I don't think it sits for anybody, but it's a, you know, it's a monster. Um, and, and I also very felt very strong that I should never sing it in America. And I was invited to come sing it at the Met. And I said, no. Well, but also the, 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 the size preconception or acoustical decibel levels of voices in America. People, there's just, there's too much of our public that goes there and sits there and is waiting for the wow factor. And the wow factor is not necessarily theatrical. Um, it, it's always got to be, and it's got, a, I think, a little bit worse. You know, if it's not pounding and racking on the walls as a as a lower male voice, then they think it's not quite as masculine as that should be, and so forth. I mean, it's a lot of nonsense that I, I I'm not sure I want to get drawn into that too much. But I just was always very careful about about uh, what fit in a European paradigm versus what. For instance, Scarpia. I'm an extremely good Scarpia. I love to sing Scarpia, but that's just not going to happen in America. That's I'm not that kind of Scarpia, and um, and I disagree with it, but I I respect it. So <clears throat> the um, I think choosing your roles is is important, and and the timing of it. But I really think it's more it's more. My goal always was to sing a long time. I think people should sing a long time. I I think I think how I sound in my forties, my thirties, my fifties, my now my sixties would be inherently different. And and what you bring artistically to a to maybe a different vocal paradigm, I think should be interesting. I always found it with interesting in, in people that I admired in front of me. The maturity factor. The maturity factor has become more and more negative. And, and that sounds sour, sour grapes on my part, and I don't mean that so much, although it is a factor in my life. I can still do a lot of things that I just don't, do, some, simply don't get asked to, to do uh, for, for, for the reasons. There's no physical reason uh, not to invite me. I'm, I'm in great shape. I feel great singing, fun, we'll have a great time, doing exactly. a lot of concerts. Yeah, yeah I, it's fine. What we do is far more athletically oriented than poetically oriented. Yeah. You know, and and I and and if you don't take care of your body, your body won't take care of you. It's like Schwarzkopf used to say, "You take care of your middle voice; the middle voice will take care of you." I so I've always, yes. you know, I've I've always really focused on keeping my vocal shit together, yeah. and 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 I did some things and did did some other things. Maybe one of my saving factors was that, you know, I got invited to do a lot of crazy things. I'm sure you do too. Uh, you know, roles that you think, what are you smoking? What sort of balanced me out vocally is that I never took on a schedule or roles that endangered me turning around and doing leader and doing song. Because my voice is a mephilous voice. My voice, my voice communicates thoughts. My voice communicates a kind of, of, of a kind of light. You have to know how your voice works. I'm not a dark middle voiced guy singing yeah. up. I'm I'm a long lyric baritone, cavalier baritone, whatever you want to call those kind of guys. Yeah, absolutely. Leontine Price describing herself. Well, I suppose I call myself a juicy lyric. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you're a juicy baritone for sure. But that's exactly what I've always heard in your voice is a beautiful, like tall sound height forward placement into the back of a hall that almost like a laser beam just shoots into the hall. It's like every time you sing, you're like, it's like your voice is right here next to me, even though I'm in the back row. And that, I, I feel like that has a lot to do with your longevity. But you know, you bring up, you bring up the fact that you sing a lot of stuff. You sing leader, you sing a lot of stuff. Now, now you're not obviously not just amazing Mozart interpreter, but you, you know, you perform Mahler, you perform Bernstein, Lieder. What do you think ties all these different styles of music together for you as a performer? And do you change your voice at all when you sing other things? The common denominator, Lucas, is human nature. I, I love human nature. I, I, think, I think people are a pain in the ass, but I think human nature is a kind of a miracle. And, and I am endlessly fascinated with, with the musical interpretation of, of human behavior. And whether that's telling the story in a song uh, or, or even being part of that story in a song or being part of a larger uh, uh, theatrical story on stage, a role in it, it, it all, it all I mean, even, even the roles you do, you know, what's, what's Figaro's education? Can he afford the shoes that he's in? How, how long, you know, the, there's always some, there's always some layer of the guys that you're singing yeah. that it makes it interesting, you know, on Yegan's insufferable ego is because he's incredibly intelligent and he's incredibly well-read. He's very, as we say in German, gebildet, you know, and he's, he's in the, he's in the country and it's sort of like, why am I here? He's I mean, born, I, absolutely. I mean, the guy owns like a, 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 a golden, uh, uh, like a case of, of combs and, and brushes and stuff, you know? So he, he cares about himself a lot and he thinks a lot about himself. I, anyway, I totally agree with you. And Onyegin, and the count, like what, where did the count come from? Surely he went to boarding school. He suckled on the teat of a wet nurse. You know, it's like, he's looking for love and he can't find it. I actually really understand the count a lot, you know, for the time <laughs> that they're living in. I'm like, look, he's right. You know why? Because he's the man of the house. And you know, that's just what it is. And the audience sees it and they think, well, that's hilarious, but I try and play it very serious to count. So, yeah. well, good for you. I think that's very true. I think there are layers to the count. Uh, you know, this is not, this is not the Trump household. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and I think you made a very good point. You know, I think it is important for the Nozze di Figaro, that we, that we understand the context in which Beaumarchais, then da Ponte and Mozart were telling the story. And there's, there's, to me, there's a, there's a huge tectonic generational shift going on, which was part and parcel to the French Revolution. So a lot of what the Count's doing all night is looking around going, you know, aha, I've got it, I figured it out, I'm, I'm in charge of this, and then something else happens. And it's always like, what's everybody so pissed off for? My uncle did this. My father did this. My great uncle did this. We've always done this. This is what we're born to do. It's fine. I mean, it's my house. I mean, you know, excuse me. Of course, I love you. That's got nothing to do with this, you know. Yeah. And I, so I, I tried. I always tried to play him. I mean, you have to be a self. -taught. I didn't want to make him an idiot. And actually, one of the reasons I quit singing the role is because the the productions got so banal. They, yeah, I just couldn't do it anymore. Clown. They started to make him a bit of a clown, a buffoon. And, and the, I've done productions where it's been, he has to be 10 steps behind and like just not a very smart. That is the opposite of what it needs. And the drama goes away. He has to be a half step away. He almost catches them when they're doing the Il Patente and the Il Sugello. Yeah, and yeah. He, he's just about to catch them. And if he does, not only are they getting fired, they might have their body parts chopped off. You know, it's like... <laughs> Like really, yeah. there needs to be serious drama going on in those moments. No, and I think I think so. I think so, and I and I think he's very quick to anger, but also very quick to be. To, I mean, he's actually a pretty nice guy. He's just he's just in his dad's and uncle's suits all night long, and he can't quite figure out what's going on. And that's I think that's what Mozart da Ponte also. They're trying to really. I mean, I think we underestimate what a tectonic shift. Same word again that those gentlemen offered us to the whole notion of masculinity and femininity and the intuitive rightness of the femininity is what these gentlemen are really trying to accept. But I think, you know, if I was having a, a conversation with a, a new producer, I would say, okay, let's turn to the back of the score. Let's look at the four bars of music comedic. 
So where does that come from? Who are those two people at that moment of that reconciliation, which is as surprising that he's on his knees singing that theme as it is her immediate resolution of what could have been, you know, the War of the Roses. And I think to me, you have to answer your question, okay, either you're going to, if you're going to take that seriously, then you start moving out from that and all yeah. of a sudden you get real people. If you're going to say that's not important, it's just a joke, it was just a vehicle to get the show ended, which I vehemently disagree with, then 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 there's another, then maybe there's another parameter. But I I like to look at roles like this. I like to and the Ponte is and and Mozart, they're just they're just endless. Hanaku used to say that that Mozart next to Shakespeare was probably the greatest dramaturg that ever lived. And mm. I think that and as I sing so many songs and so forth, I think that I have found over the last especially 10, 15 years, and maybe even in teaching and so forth, that really great song composers are psychologists. And uh, uh, and and there was never a greater one than Schubert, and uh, it's just it it endlessly fascinates me the argument to Schubert that he wrote so many songs that he was indifferent to the quality of texts. I think misses the point that he was endlessly fascinated with any any attempt of a poet to de to define or articulate human behavior, yeah. and the miracle. Is not the sense, is not the choice of text. The miracle of Schubert, of many, is that he found a musical language specific to each of those schools of thought. Yes. This just 660 songs. Hello, of course I love the stage. I've been called a good actor. It all comes from music. I just let my imagination go and I try to have it read in my body. And, and I like to keep a sense of surprise on stage. You know, so longevity, first of all, has to be a desire by the singer. But on the other hand, Lucas, you're, you're on the cusp. The, the, the young colleagues I'm working with in day and day that are in their 20s and early 30s, and they're coming out of, you know, uh, young artist programs. And, and some of them are very talented, but they're having a hard time getting up what I call the salmon ladder. Because a lot of these intendants, realize they have a success on their hands but and they should be paying them more but they don't want to pay them more so they treat them badly so they get a complex i mean it's a, it's a pretty rank business uh, and um i have no ambition to run an opera house but if there was ever a reason i would it's just to simply for a short amount of time show that you don't have to be like that yeah put some but good in the world yeah. there's another conversation about that but my point is that is that these kids when they sing what they sing and they're planning their repertoire, and I work both in, in a lead academy as well as a, as an opera workshop. Yeah. They give no thought. It's not in their consciousness at all whether it's too soon to sing that, other than can I physically sing that? And again, you can read biographies and, oh, yes, Rosa Poncel made her med debut, and she was 21, and she sang, you know, yada, yada. Then you also have to look at, at different perspectives and sensibilities. But also, how long did Rosa Poncel study under what circumstances before she opened her mouth publicly? That was also, I mean, the whole development of, of, of studios and what those great voices of, of the early years went through in development before they were ever considered ready for any kind of professional activity is also a completely different uh, totally. equation. Just totally. throwing some talented kid into an, a young artist program, which is essentially in most theaters, cheap labor uh, for, for ensemble roles and confirmaria roles, and then beat the hell out of them during the day with their arias and deformer classes, I guess. You know, this is not training. This is, this is usury. And uh, I think um, I... And, and on top of where I'm going with all that is I don't know too many of the leading figures today in opera that ever have a concern about or even know that if that singer at the age of 30 or 31 heads into that repertoire, it will have a direct relationship to the shortness of their career. If you're developing a repertoire, you have to be sensible about what you're building and 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 that's hard in the business today because we're everybody is so desperate to get a job that they'll take on you'll take almost anything. But if you have the opportunity to say, well, this brings me, this brings me, this brings me this. Where I really started with this, and I keep coming back to it, is these presenters and these intendants, do they know to ask the question, is that dangerous? And if they do know and don't ask the question, it's irresponsible. 
And if you answer the question, you become difficult. So quickly we become difficult, right? Like it's, it gets put back on the artist. Like I once asked for a pair of show underwear because I was running around all night. I didn't want to get my own underwear sweaty. I just thought, oh, no, no, I didn't even ask. I said, if I give you, if I bring an extra pair of underwear at the end of the night, would you wash them for me and include them in my costume? I'll write my name, the Sharpie. And all of a sudden, Mr. Meacham wants a special pair of underwear. What a Devo. <sighs> Have you experienced I believe that? it. And, 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 oh, God, are you kidding? I've been doing this for 40 some years. You know, I, I think I've experienced I've experienced a lot. I don't want to sound so jaded because I, I've had a, I had a, I've had a wonderful run, and and uh, and I've had a lot of opportunity, and and I've made myself available for a lot of opportunity. That's another thing. It's just yeah, this isn't a marketing or branding gig. This is are you ready for the next level? And being ready for the next level is not waiting for the next level to get ready for it. Damn straight. <laughs> you yeah, know, when that when that train comes so, by, you have to be ready to hop on. The other thing is, I don't break contracts. I'd rather not sign a contract. And I was labeled difficult early on because I wanted to know who the conductor was. I wanted to know who the producer was before I did major productions. But that that label of difficult, and, and, I'm, and I'm very aware that this conversation will be heard by a lot of people, and especially our colleagues. And I'm really speaking more colleague to colleague with you tonight, not just you, but whoever's listening. I don't, I'm not really concerned about our public understanding the conundrums and paradoxes we live in. I, I am always really concerned as an elder statesman to embolden, empower, and embrace is what I call it. But sometimes it's tough love. Sometimes it's also, look, you're in a new world. You're in a completely different world than I was in at your age. You need a technique that is essentially indestructible because you're going to be asked to do a lot of really weird things. And if you don't know where home base is vocally, it'll pull you apart. And I... I to me, you ask me, why am I still singing? What do I still work on? Health, diet, vocal technique. There is not a day I don't, I don't warm up. My warming up is part of my yoga. I need yoga at my age. If I don't do yoga in the morning, I can't stand up straight during the day. So I've got, you know, my knee, my knees are 120 years old. Everything else is hanging together. My knees have said, fuck you. Uh, and so I'm working well, on that. That's great because you actually you're kind of answering my next question because I, I get asked in interviews all the time, Lucas, uh, what advice do you have for younger singers? And I want to ask you, Tom, what advice do you have for me and people at my point in a career? How old are you? 44. Fantastic time. You should be. You are. You are hitting your stride. What you can. What envelope you can push on now. And what you want to keep in your repertoire, you're you're right at that time. You've got you've got both windows. I keep yourself challenged. I I never was able to just have a set of repertoire and, and do it. I don't know how these Broadway folks do it. I I I'd kill myself. Yeah. You know I, I did I, I I a couple of years ago I did 16 performances of Mary Widow and you know, yeah. you know, but I think you're hitting you know at 44 as a as a juicy lyric, you know you've you've got it all there. You've got the top. You can also you're also at a time where your vocal paradigm is intact. In other words, what you've got is what you've got. And and if you want to work on it this way or you want to work on it that way, whatever it is, but you know who you are. You've yeah. got you've got your stuff. You also which which is liberating because you say, Okay, I'm never gonna be that. Yeah. Right? And I've accepted but I should, Yeah, and, and and that can be people might be confused. You know, we all have to we all have to accept that, you know, and, and once you get older, should you live to sing into your 60s, which I wish you very much. And there's no reason for a baritone or any other singer. It, it's mad, but you can't hire yourself is the problem. <laughs> you know, Holy. there's no I mean, really, there's no there's no physical reason for it if you keep yourself together. But you must respect that your your vocal technique is must be in complete coordination with your develop, development physically. And our bodies do develop differently. I mean, and I say this to my, my young colleagues, especially your head doesn't ossify, i.e. turn into bone until you're 32 years old. So what do you think you're defining for your career at the age of 28? No, don't do that to yourself. You know, get sing as beautifully and as securely and as musically 
as possible for as long as possible. And if that becomes your goal every day, you will sing a very long time. Yeah. Singing a long time in our business is unfortunately a very complex question. It, you have to, one has to take the personal issues off the table. You have to make sure that you actually are singing really well. And you are paying attention. About I can promise you 44 is not 49, is not 53, is not 58. You know, that what, what, what you go through from 28 to 31, 31 to 36, 36 to 41, you know, that those, those, those maturations and metamorphoses of yeah. your body, first and foremost, it's not your throat, guys. It is not your throat. The vocal folds are perfectly happy. It's the muscles of our bodies, whether they're intact, whether they're firm, whether the if you've kept yourself in some kind of shape. I personally believe that a, that it, that it, you, a six pack abs is nonsense, but you damn well better have some good abs, and yeah. the, and it better be sorted by some pretty strong glutes too, yeah. you know. And because you need all that power pack to keep this limber, and keep the breathing wide, you know. And you don't need to run sixteen miles. You don't need to keep your weight. You know, your weight will take care of itself. Eat more vegetables than carbohydrates that's a pretty easy rule you know be careful with the beer be careful with the wine be careful with the spirits be careful with the dope be careful. Now, now that some kind my my home state now has legal marijuana you know uh i'm done with that but i mean the point is that the point is whatever it is in your life also human relationships you know to me discipline is the ordering of the random and in our lives as artists and singers and professionals and in this business, we have no room for randomness. And, 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 and you get addicted to that. And I think that's why you're in such good shape and you moving forward, you know, I, I guess I would also say if, if as tough as this business is, and it is really murderous, it's a, it's a very unpleasant forum in which the greatest of art forms takes place. I, I don't mean to be cynical about it, but I do think it's a very difficult world, more difficult even than, than in, in my day, as it were. And if you lose the love, if you lose the got to do it, never give up. And if you ever get seduced into three is less than 30 is less than 300 is less than 3000 is less than 3 million on the screen, if you get seduced into that thought process versus why you're singing what you're singing and how important it is it for you that you believe that your public should hear what it is that you're singing. This is my absolute light in life. I Anything, I've sung some really nasty guys. I think Giovanni is a piece of work. I think he's an absolutely horrible guy. Most of the time I wanted to go home and just take a shower and drink a couple of beers and try and forget the whole thing. There's nothing charming about Don Giovanni. I think he's an absolute psychopath, much less sociopath. But, and I've always felt that, but my, my point is, is it, is it, I know he's important. I know a lot of things that I sing are a tough chew sometimes, but I know it's important and I want people to hear it because I know if they go there, they're going to have a aha moment. And this is what as I, as a musician and an artist live for. And I am not particularly concerned whether it's 30 people or 3000 people or whatever it is. That's just, that's not why I sing. Yeah. Wow. I, I needed to hear so much of that. I have to say, and I really, appreciate yeah, but you, it. And, I, and I, I'm speaking to you like a big brother. I no, know that. I, I know I'm, I'm happy to hear it because I'm actually going through, I won't say anything on this interview, but I am going through some questions in my mind right now about direction. It's like two roads to in and narrow wood at this moment, you know? And so I'm, I am thinking a lot about these questions. And you know what really keeps me me solid technically is a, is a is a, a solid warm up routine that I've done for the last 15 20 years that I can always go back to and say I need a little more I need a little less I know exactly what I'm going to sound like before Bravo. I walk on stage. And that's been really good for me. Which brings me to a question that I have for you. Do you consider your high G easy and if so has it have you just always had it? No, I have not always had it. Uh, by any means. In fact, when I auditioned for my then voice teacher at USC, I come down to Spokane, Washington. I was 
I don't know, 12. <laughs> I don't know. I have to think how old I was. I was in my early 20s. <clears throat> and Horst Gunther, Horst Gunther was the visiting baritone teacher at USC and, and, and being a professional and a German and all that. And it was, everybody was auditioning to get into a studio. And he taught me, he taught me the, the, the security of, of the top and the bottom. The bottom's got to have the top, the top's got to have the bottom. When you go up in your voice, it's like a ladder on a wall. You know, the ladder's going to be fatter at the bottom and you get thinner at the top. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have a very bad ladder, right? Mm -hmm. And just keep on. So we were just bouncing things up. And all of a sudden, I was, I, for the first time in my life, I was vocalizing up to high A's and then up to high B flats. And of course, there's a voix finta and, and, and whatever that is. But we got that voix mix going. Sort of, so I started trusting that I went, la, 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 la. And mm -hmm. it was out of my throat. Yeah. It was out of my throat. I sang a lot beautifully, says they, but it was still with a lot of a lot of holding. And to to really find that height, which was actually my real voice, and with all the depth behind it, was learning how to open. Learning how to open because the jaw doesn't up and down, it goes back and forth. And to open and you know get that sound la up there rather than la. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, no, I never, I did not have it always. But curiously, the 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 Gemont, which is a G flat, yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. that I always you somehow found my way into. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly right. But that actual sort of acrobatic, la, 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 and, yeah. and I would get tired too quickly. Oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> the other thing was I had what I love to work with my young colleagues today, you know, singing pure vowels at the top of your voice is really, really stupid. <laughs> you know, find that you have to find that neutral resonance with resonance, which I best describe in the ah uh, vowel that in the, inter, in the international phonetic yeah. alphabet, it's like the, vowel it's like the, it's like the, uh, modifies yeah. to, uh, yes. And so when I started singing la, 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 love the top of your voice, la, heard ah i sang love everyone home happy and i got i got stronger with it and i got more dependable depend on it you know you have to learn how to piece yourself together and at the end of the day all the coachings and teachings they're so important and having the right coach and, and don't teach your hop and coach hop stick with something for a while until you know it doesn't work and then be brave enough to go but the point is at the end of the day you have to somehow teach yourself you have to know how you are, who you are, and how it works. And and you can, and I say that cautiously because, you know, just being seduced by your own brilliance is also pretty stupid, you know. And and then, you, you know, I'm no, I don't mean that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, so yeah. you know, it's it's fun. Well, Tom, you have given, you've been so generous with your time. You've been so generous no. with your words. I, if you don't mind, I got about five minutes of rapid questions and rapid fire. And uh, if you don't mind, let's get started with some rapid fire. Favorite, Schubert leader. Oh, shit. <laughs> I really hate favorite uh, questions. My favorite of anything is what I'm singing. Boom. Tenors you admire today. Piotr Bechala. I love, I've always loved Kaleha's voice. I, I just love that old fashioned, old -fashioned beautiful scream. Yeah, beautiful I love it. Spin, yeah. Uh, but Piotr is, 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 you know, that's, that's the real deal. Is yoga part of your practice routine? For 43 years, daily, mm -hmm. religiously, and will be to the day I die. Quick advice for singing the counts, Aria. Be serious take every word he says from where it comes and he's got a lot of rapid thoughts going on in his mind just take it serious it's not it's not a fach it he's a very complex and and actually more generous personality like you've been we've been talking about so take him serious in what he says and especially when you get to the aria don't harangue when you don't don't bitch be questioning he's he's a very insecure guy the conte is an elegant he loses his temper sometimes in the recitative, but he catches himself. When he sings, it is legato. It is noble. It's based in your whole core of sound. It has height. 
and vulnerability to it. He's always one step behind everybody else. So he's a little bit insecure all night long, like this isn't supposed to be happening, yeah. you know, but he's a serious human being. Do not bark. All right. Uh, last one. Were you ever called a tenor? Yeah, many times. There's a very, very famous producer, Tito Cababianco, wouldn't have anything to do with me. No, no, no. He's a lazy tenor. Until he learns to sing, I don't want to work. I cannot work with him. Lazy I cannot tenor. work with him. I've got you know what they call a lazy tenor? Multi baritone. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. But you know, Horst Gunther working on the on the Barber Seville, he said, you know, you have to every top of every male lower voice must be sung like the tenor. The whole invention of the Verdi baritone, whatever the hell that thing means, was a a decapitation of the stress level at the top to bring the accordion emotional power and 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 liveness and lyricism in the upper middle voice of the baritone. We are related to the tenors on top of us, not to the basses below us. Yeah, amen, brother. Amen. I'll give you a slow clap for that one. Yeah, we go. <laughs>